I first met Sandy when I was 17 and arrived at CalArts from upstate New York. And I was just riveted by him, but also suddenly convinced that he was the one I had to get close to at the school. I mean, I don't think that was true for many students there because for a lot of students there, he seemed almost like the antichrist of an art school. The thing that set Sandy apart from other instructors at CalArts, he was his own little island uh, in a way of discipline, of rigorous um, study, of, of kind of classical education. And CalArts, I mean, I can only describe it as kind of this, um, it was a very avant-garde art school, except for the Disney animation school that existed in its own very tiny bubble in one corner. The things going on in photography and dance and music um, were all way out. Really cool, but way out. And what Sandy represented was a kind of, to a lot of students, was a kind of old guard. He had these different rules about filmmaking, what was dramatic, what was not dramatic. And most people arriving at an art school were not interested in the rules the old school rules. They wanted to break boundaries. They wanted to do four hour films or atonal films or, you know, what was hot and interesting at that moment in the school was not necessarily what Sandy was teaching. I mean, I was very, very much dead set on being a narrative filmmaker. So um, he was the one person there that really held a lot of what I needed to know. Sandy was a movie director and it wasn't just because his resume said so, when he came in a room, you understood he had accomplished a tremendous amount and he had led um, his own kind of creative army through a lot of battles. And there was a sense of power, of vision, of um, and history about him. He was a riveting human being in the sense that he had accomplished so much and had seen so much, yet was deeply dissatisfied with his own work. For instance, if he were introducing Sweet Smell or any of his films at a screening at CalArts, he'd talk about it as a deeply flawed, um, tragic um, exercise. He would, I mean, he'd overdo it, but he would always frame his own creative endeavors with a kind of, um, we'd throw a flag on the play and he'd say, there was a lot wrong with this. Sandy had this kind of pessimism or this kind of sense of dissatisfaction with his work and his teachings, and, but it was kind of this winning sense of, of uh, modesty. And in the same sense, I feel like he viewed film theory in its most pure um, idea, um, and which was quite in vogue at that point in the 80s, as uh, pompous or kind of um, existing separate from any connection to the actual making of the art. And that while he didn't think it was invalid, someone could analyze any text or track or film any way they want and should, I think Sandy had this kind of feeling that it was just completely, completely separate. Well, a lot of what was being talked about was separate from anything he knew about the choices and decisions getting made in the writing, directing, cutting of a movie. And yet he had a deeply analytical mind and, uh, and um, really, I think, strived to instill in us some sense of film history, some sense of art history, um, Aristotelian theory, um, dramatic theory, um, all these things not in the context of kind of film theory, but much more in the context of dramatic theory. He was focused on what he thought was rarely addressed in film education. I think Sandy felt that film schools kind of almost gave students what they wanted instead of what they needed. What most young film geeks like me arrived at film school wanting was to play with lenses and cameras and dollies and light meters and lights and switchers in the video room. And most young filmmakers kind of of my generation were coming to it as film heads who had watched a lot of movies and then played with mainly at that moment Super 8 um, heavily. So we were very tech, we were very adept. but. What he felt all of our films were missing, and I think he was right, was story, but A, a kind of ability to tell a story in many cases, but also an understanding of acting, blocking, um, the relationship with actors, which he always felt was more critical to a director than any kind of intimacy with an ingenue 10 to 120. So that there was, a, there was some level where his feeling was, guys, you know enough about lenses, let's talk about 
how a scene works and how blocking and layering and what you see first and second and third may all relate to the kind of the dramatic unfolding of the writing. One model he used very much was he even had this great sketch he drew of, um, of a man, a kind of a kind of almost Herculean figure holding a movie house. He had no head, but he had instead a movie house because the director was this Herculean figure, was somehow to be guiding this mass of people on this unfolding journey of revelations and epiphanies, of turnings, um, things falling around, things changing. What he wanted us to get was that this kind of idea that in every scene and in every moment, there needed to be this moment of, of free fall. You needed to feel this sense of danger. You needed to feel this sense of something alive was happening and that the points weren't being connected like they were in a Child Connect the Dots book. Sandy's office was um, these needlepoint-like rules running the circumference of his office all around. Each one said things like exposition, when it feels like exposition means it's in the wrong place, or um, uh, a character who thinks ahead is more interesting, or, and these were all these little aphorisms that would be on the walls, and he literally, when you brought in your little script for your short or whatever, he'd be going, well, I think you need to look at number three, number four, and number 22. And I've seen in his own movies how he broke plenty of them. And I've seen in my own humble creations how I've broke plenty of them. But I think what he always asked of us was to be aware of what's worked in the past so that you can either decide to do it or not. But that when you make the decision not to do it, you understand the liabilities, the narrative liabilities you're carrying forward. Part of what makes movies interesting is pushing the boundaries of things so that, and, and not following all the rules. But I think the most interesting films follow some to hold you in place and break others to make you think. And that where you realize you can get into trouble is if you pay attention to none. And because of the way CalArts was structured, one of the most active areas in his life and the student life, the uh, students who worked with him, was um, as, what they called mentor-mentee relationships. He was my mentor. That was one of the really most exciting places um, and times with Sandy was where he'd address student projects, take them apart. By, yes, by the rules above, but also by um, just also wrapping his mind around them in ways that, that we got to see a director's mind and a writer's mind, frankly, because Sandy really had a writer's mind as well. Um, taking apart and putting back together our, our, our little scripts. You cobble together some script in th between midnight and 3 a.m. on Tuesday night and hand it in Wednesday morning. And somehow, by your mentor meeting at 4 p.m., he's written seven pages in longhand about my four-page crummy script. What, what Sandy taught you in those moments was just, whatever crap you hand me, I'm gonna take it seriously. And I'm going to do my job. And I'm going to write, I'm going to invest in your ideas, even frankly, if they're half baked and you pull them out of your ass. You felt criminal sitting there having this brilliant guy talk about your dribble um, in this deep way. And 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 it made you wanna, it made you back up and prepare and prepare much more in advance and try and come to him with much deeper ideas. Sandy was a fan of many different movies, and we'd analyze, I mean, we'd analyze La Ventura. We'd analyze, I mean, he was not limited to kind of conventionally constructed um, movies only. I mean, one of the movies we analyzed was 310 to Yuma, and then on the other hand, we'd analyze Antonioni films or, or Last Year in Marienbad. I mean, that he would go everywhere, and what he'd try and do is illustrate that in each one of these cases, um, an essential mission Con uh, a clarity of mission was always important. And for him, I think he believed, for the students especially, his mentees, that meant a screenplay that works. When a student finished a script, I remember the thing Sandy would always say is, good, write another. The model he presented was one of continuous effort. Because as many of us found, when we'd end up in a cutting room with him with one of our short films, if we didn't know what the narrative engine of the movie was, we were going to have to discover it at some point. 
And that could be in a cutting room and suddenly you're writing voiceover and you're reordering the scenes and you're, you're trying to find something that pulls an audience in. And there's this very, all of us who make movies, you get this moment, this magical moment when, when whatever combination of the narrative blueprint on the script and the, co and the actors and their takes on the characters and the way it's shot, there's a moment where an audience gets hooked. And what's prevalent in so many student works is just, is the absence of that energy, of that, that you're working to stay attentive because the film never grabs you. It never presents, it never posits an initial question which it's going to answer. Any kind of analysis of films was pretty much limited to um, an analytic projector and 16 millimeter prints of movies. And, um, and he would in class, we'd, you know, I spent a lot of time running these projectors down to these scenes and all our prints of all the movies he analyzed were filled with burn marks from where we'd hold on a frame too long and the frame of the film would burn from the heat of the projector bulb. But the Sandy's method of making these handouts would be that we'd take that same projector we'd put in his office, we'd point it at the wall, he'd tape a piece of white paper on the wall and he'd tell me to freeze on a frame and then he'd quickly sketch um, an outline of the frame of the movie. All this because it was, it was technically impossible at, in those days to kind of walk a student through a movie in the way you can now um, with a DVD player almost with ease. So these handouts were in part to produce some kind of roadmap of the pieces and parts of a scene in a film so we could discuss it and hold it in front of us. And, um, but I do miss, I do miss those days. Like when I go into a class and I see now that electronics have made it possible to just kind of watch a scene 30 times or put it on a loop on the DVD player, there is still something about looking at these parts on a piece of paper and seeing them as these different cards almost that were played. It, it just focuses the mind in a different way. Sandy never used his own movies as teaching models. He showed his films and he would talk about the making of them. I think two things happen when you, when as a director or writer, you show your films to students. Um, one is, and it's very interesting, is the students want to know all about all the drama and politics and hysteria that went on to making the film. And so there becomes very little discussion of the craft inevitably because there's just so much more interesting things to talk about in a kind of salacious way about just the battles making a movie. When the film is not owned or authored by the teacher, there is, there's the ability to see it simply as a series of choices and all that other stuff we're not privy to. And um, I, think, I think that's why. Um, I also do, as I've said already, Sandy was really humble about his own work. And he viewed, I don't agree with him, but he would talk about his failed career. He did not refer to himself or kind of frame himself with any grandeur. And that, so I just don't think it fit into that personality that he'd show you his films to teach you what he had done. Having said that, he had a lot of tricks and a lot of techniques that he'd share that he'd acquired making those movies. And, um, uh, I, I think specifically about working with actors, about um, how writing and understanding what's behind the writing is so important to the dialogue with actors and the, to the staging of scenes with actors. In my third year at CalArts, he literally told me that you took all my classes in the first year and then you TA'd all my classes again in the second year. There's nothing you're going to get from me this year, this next year. And so what in my third year at CalArts he exhorted me to do was to audition for the theater school as an actor and try and get admission into the theater school as an actor. And he would assist me getting credit in my film school year for the theater year I was doing. And, um, and his feeling, because he had so said this so much to students, but he was using me as a kind of test case in this, was that what was lacking and what the film school couldn't provide an education in was acting. What it made me aware of was just how to come at both writing and filmmaking from inside. And I don't mean inside like method acting. I mean inside like just you have to do it. The best example I can give is that one of the things Sandy talked about from his own directing experience, very practical things, was how um, you should always walk the blocking of your actors yourself. 
because so much frustration and so much angst on a movie set can be from this, this separation in which you don't understand the sensuality of what they actually have to pull off with their bodies. And that one of his pieces of advice was walk it. Just walk what you're asking them to do so you feel it for yourself. And he even had this extra thing, walk it backwards. If you can't walk their blocking backwards um, and forwards and understand it, then why, then, then when they're struggling, how can you do it? And certainly, unless you actually put yourself there, sometimes you can't feel it. And that's a profound gift that Sandy gave me. If you take some of these different aphorisms and you analyze them, one is a character is most interesting who thinks ahead. And you look at a character like Sidney Falco, Tony Curtis's character in that film is continually in motion and continually making moves. Um, from the opening of the film, just opening that newspaper at that at that um, at the at the the hot dog counter and finding finding JJ's column and rifling down, seeing something we don't know what he throws the paper away. We don't know why his actions are making us ask questions. His mind is running a hundred miles a minute, and we're seeing him making all these moves that only make some sense. But because the character's in action and making proactive choices. He's completely interesting to us. And, and we're starting to figure out what he is and who he is through his actions. As opposed to, um, you know, many films, I wouldn't call it lazier, I just called it a different route, would try and set the table of what a press agent is. I mean, imagine an audience in this year, in the 50s, it's like how many people even understand the relationship of columnists to um, people who, who hand them blurbs and pieces, um, and the kind of incestuous relationship between the press and press flax and how that all works. There is never a moment, really, where that's explained in the film. A if anything, it gets explained much later, almost in the, in the late first act or second act of the film. But in the beginning, you're just watching how it works and you're watching almost as if it's a nature documentary, how this lizard eats that ant, and that ant tries to escape from this lizard by hiding behind this tree. And you're understanding the ecosystem of New York show business and nightlife and press and entertainment and this nexus through action. Um, that's all contained in that one aphorism. There was another one he had about how so often um, in films, antagonists are more interesting um, because they're after something. And one of, the, one of the things Sandy would both analyze and talk with us a lot about was one of the struggles in modern storytelling was that the hero is so passive. We're, it's a regular guy who's doing nothing and up to nothing, as most of us are going through our lives, and then shit happens to them. And the shit that happens to them is usually the result of a very driven antagonist. And that on that very simple mechanism, you then got into very interesting observations. In, in Sweet Smell, one of the really interesting ones that, that always occurred to me and talked about, I talked about with Sandy was how there was really, like by the good guy, bad guy model, there were very few good guys in the movie. I think Marty Milner and, his, and, and JJ's sister are the good guys and they are, um, supporting characters, but in a way they, they are the only characters you really root for in the movie. And it's a very interesting model, a very complicated model. I don't think one that would easily be followed by his aphorisms. Um, because certainly by the end of Sweet Smell, spoiler alert, um, certainly by the end of Sweet Smell, Susan, JJ's sister, has outfoxed them all. And so very much like other films of Sandy's, it's kind of almost this character, a, a naive character, has somehow undone or un, un, um, who has outfoxed kind of much more cunning and Machiavellian characters. One thing he always talked about in our movies was how deadly it was in writing to talk about a character off screen for too long by name. Everyone would be talking about some character that you never see. And another one of his dictums, aphorisms, was, you know, movies should really work with the volume off, that you should understand it as visual storytelling. So clearly, if, if the movie is about, if, if the opening of a film has a lot of people talking about a character who is not present, and that goes on a long time, 
how would that work in, as a silent film? It wouldn't, you wouldn't know what's going on. And I think one of the interesting strategies Sandy uses in Sweet Smell is this, it's, it's an incredible build to the reveal of J.J. Hunsecker and Burt Lancaster in that role at the 21 Club. It's geometry in the sense that every single way you can reveal a character or show a piece of a character without showing all of a character is tried in this sequence. We see him as an illustration. We see him as a photograph. We hear him as a name. Sidney Falco arrives at his office. He meets his dowdy assistant. Foil character, another one of Sandy's aphorisms. Always supply your protagonist with foil characters who ask questions the audience wants to know. And she's asking all these questions. Why would he want to do this to you? Why would he want to steal your livelihood? Again, JJ, JJ. But the other interesting thing that Sandy does, even with a scene like that, and I don't want to credit only Sandy, but Ernest Lehman and Clifford Odets, is uh, even a scene like that with his assistant, is not only a scene of information, but it's a scene that Sydney is busy working the phones. She's asking these questions, but the scene is not about her questions. In the blocking in every way, he's like a shark moving around that office. She's asking the questions the audience wants to know, but he's almost hardly addressing her or turning, giving her half an answer and getting back to his business. And at the same time, there's a whole nother layer to those scenes, which is you see that she loves him. You see that his assistant has a crush on him and may even have had a moment of uh, some kind of sexual liaison with him. All these layers are built into what in a, in a lesser filmmaker's hands or writer's hands could be a purely expository scene where Sidney faces his assistant and instead that exposition is supplied but also, again, for that other aphorism, supported through action. The character, the lead character, never stops moving toward his goal. Even if someone like a Jiminy Cricket on his shoulder is asking questions, um, he supplies the answers while moving the story forward as opposed to stopping the film. And even at the point when your protagonist, Tony Curtis, has arrived at the same place that J.J. Hunsecker exists, and they're within 20 feet of each other in opposite rooms, and he chooses, instead of walking in the room, to go to the payphones by the restrooms. The man is literally on the other side of the wall from Sydney. But the movie takes the time to do this elaborate dance, this last dance, this stretching of it. And, you know, I have not seen ever, really, in a film, a kind of um, a more flamboyantly brilliant and well-executed delay and reveal of a character. And not only is he teasing you, but it's serving a purpose. And this was always what I think Sandy tried to get to us as students, is break the rules for a reason. The reason he was denying us JJ was because he needed to set up JJ as a huge source of power. It's not a movie about a mobster. It's not a movie about a crime boss. But in a sense, with a pen, JJ Hunsecker has the power to kill. How do you create for an audience this sense of authority, um, the sense that the world emanates from this figure, like a pope or a mobster or a mayor. How do we come to understand that so many lines of power run from this one man? And one way to do it is to follow all the ants on the anthill to finally get to the queen. And that the longer you take and the more circuitous the path, the more the audience understands in a really palpable way how incredibly untouchable this man is. And I think that, that, that the tour de force of that opening comes from both the following of Sandy's rules and, again, um, him dancing around some of them. I mean, I'd have to say is I feel like he was a really paternal figure for me. I always felt a tremendous sense of being honored and chosen and lucky and um, that it gave me, in the darkest times in my own career to come, it always gave me this light to draw upon where you just felt that you had this kind of wind in your sails from this incredibly great, brilliant man who you had worked with and who had believed in you. And um, that is a kind of gift that isn't reducible to a rule.